we're going to, uh, <clears throat> let's see, so we were studying in the book of Romans, right? And we were in Romans chapter number one. We finished the study in Romans chapter number one. And then uh, <clears throat> two weeks ago, instead of me starting into, or last week, instead of me starting into Romans chapter number two, we went over and looked at kind of a Bible overview lesson last week. And we looked at the issue of the kingdom and uh, how we know that we're not living in the kingdom today and that what God said to Israel about the kingdom that he promised unto them are very literal things that will be fulfilled in the future. And if you understand that difference between Israel and the body of Christ, if you understand that God really meant what he said and those things that he talked about in the kingdom, and if you believe those to be literal things, then it saves you from a lot of doctrinal error when it comes over to your view of eschatology, which is the fancy word to just say the study of the end times, what's going to happen in the future. And uh, people who don't understand the difference between Israel and the body of Christ, they get, they get confused. Um, it leads to confusion, right? If you don't rightly divide the word of truth, it leads to all kinds of confusion. Confusion on the gospel, confusion into how should we then live, confusion as to what is God doing today, right? And so the, that, the issue that we talked about as it leads to confusion on what God's going to do in the future, that's just one of a long list of, of issues that, that come up. So let's look at Romans chapter number two tonight. We're going to break into that. I want to read some verses, and then I want to talk about a, just a brief recap of Romans chapter number one, because then that tells you what, we're, what Romans chapter two is going to do and what it's what it's going to accomplish, okay? So tonight what I want to do is I just want to give a, a high-level overview of what is going on in Romans. We've all, we, we know the issue in Romans chapter number one, but as we see what Romans chapter two is going to do, we're going to see what is it that Paul is trying to accomplish? What is the purpose of, of Romans? What, what is trying to be established, okay? So let's, let's read. We're going to read for, from, uh, let's begin reading in verse number one. Paul says, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same? that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. So we're going to stop reading right there. We're going to talk a little bit about where we came from and where we're going and how that fits in with those verses that we just read. Now, Romans is a book about righteousness. If you had to talk about the, the issue that's going on in the book of Romans, we tell people that if you want to understand the gospel, if you don't want to understand what it, what it means to be justified in order to be, what it means to be saved, you go to the book of Romans, right? You don't go to the book of Leviticus. You don't go to the book of Deuteronomy. You go to the book of Romans. And in chapter 2, we're going to continue, continue to deal with the issue of righteousness. Now, in chapter number 1, I basically, we can break chapter number 1 down into three sections. The first part of chapter number 1, Paul deals with the issue of his apostleship. First of all, you need to understand that Paul is the, the apostle of the Gentiles, that the revelation of the mystery was committed unto Paul, that Paul says, I preach Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. And that's important because if you didn't know that, if you didn't know Paul's unique ministry, uh, you might think that Paul is just going to continue to preach the same gospel that Peter preached in the book of Acts or, or the gospel of the kingdom that they were sent out preaching in Matthew. So the first thing is you need to understand Paul's unique ministry. You need to understand what it was that Christ, the resurrected and risen Lord Jesus Christ, had committed unto Paul. So once Paul deals with that, you know who I am 
and you know what it is that I'm about, the second thing that Paul says, the second thing that we deal with in Romans chapter number one, is the issue of the gospel. Now, Paul says, uh, I'm therefore, I'm ready to preach the gospel to, to, to you who are in Rome. And the reason why he was ready to preach the gospel, if you recall, is because Paul says, I'm ready to preach the gospel because therein is the righteousness of God revealed. Man needs God's righteousness. And Paul says, I'm ready to preach the gospel because that, the gospel, is the only source from which you can obtain righteousness. And then he goes and spends the last half of the chapter dealing with topic number three, which is the issue of uh, um, the reason why we need that gospel. And the reason why we need that gospel is because it tells you how unrighteous men are. And that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, all unrighteousness of men. So here's the predicament that we find ourselves in. We know that men are unrighteous. We know that the gospel of Christ is where the righteousness of God is revealed. And so if there's a wrath of God that's going to be revealed against unrighteousness, we need a cure, we need a solution, we need something to solve this predicament that we find ourselves in. And Paul says the gospel is the issue. Now from, from Romans chapter 1 there, where he starts dealing about the wrath of God being revealed against all unrighteousness, all the way over until Romans chapter 3 and verse number 20, we're going to deal with the same topic. And that topic is the issue of why we need the gospel. The unrighteousness of men. Now, he doesn't go through the second half of chapter number 1, all the way through Romans chapter 3 and verse number 20, just continuing to list the same wicked things that he does in the second half of Romans chapter 1, right? Because if you remember, when we read through Romans chapter 1, there were some pretty explicit bad things that men were doing. That downward spiral of man's thinking process, when I reject God and I become, I, I no longer have the light of God in my mind, then they go into all sorts of depravity and wickedness and rebellion against God. They change out the natural order that God had created. But now Romans chapter 2 is going to get into something that's slightly different. But you see, despite God giving man truth in chapter number 1, it explains how the wicked got to be wicked, right? So now we're not left wondering, why is the world in the shape that it's in? Why is the world like it is? What their thinking process is. It explains to us what their actions are. And then also importantly is that Paul gives the historical demonstration of how God gave them up, gave them up, gave them over. And you know, the, know the, now the issue of why is there an, a, an issue of Israel versus the Gentiles? Why is there an issue of circumcision versus uncircumcision? Because God gave the nations up. God gave the world up because of their unrighteousness, because they hated him, because they didn't want to retain God in their knowledge. So he gave the whole world up, and then he chose Abraham and started to work it with him and through him, and that's where the nation of Israel comes from. So there's a dispensational aspect that we find also running through Romans chapter number 1. Now the issues of the things that he says there, if you look at verse number 29, verse number 30, I mean, when it talks about fornication and wickedness and covetousness and malicious, maliciousness, murder. I mean, does anyone really need this? Is anyone really confused on the fact that murder is bad and that murder is wrong? I mean, nobody had to tell Cain that it was wrong when he murdered his brother Abel. I mean, he was already convicted when God showed up and said, uh, hey, uh, Cain, where's your brother? And what did Cain say? Am I my brother's keeper? I don't know. God says the, his blood cries out. Now, so all of these things are very obvious, right? Very, very obvious. But what Romans chapter number 2 is going to deal with is Romans chapter 2 is now going to come over and deal with the self-righteous. It's going to deal with those who try to make a fair show on the outside. 
right? So if you look at verse number one of Romans chapter two again, where Paul says, therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doest the same things. So there's someone coming along, and we'll, we'll get into this point in a minute, but there's someone who's coming along and says, yeah, those wicked things that Paul just talked about, <laughs> yeah, that's not me. Yeah, those murderers, yeah, those are pretty wicked guys. I'm no murderer. I'm pretty good. I'm, you know, I'm pretty righteous. You know, I don't, I don't commit fornication. I don't murder anybody. And so he's trying to justify himself, right? There's a sense of judging others to put them down to elevate oneself. So what we're dealing with here is the self-righteous. Hold your place in Romans and look at Galatians chapter number 6. Galatians chapter 6. Now, the book of Galatians, Paul writes to those who have been saved by grace, and then they leave grace, and what did they go put themselves back under? If you're going to leave grace, where's the only place to go? Law. And if you're putting yourself back under the law, what are you trying to accomplish? You're, you're trying to accomplish a performance-based system. You're trying to say, look at, I can perform in the flesh. I can do this. Look at how great I am. And so Paul says this in verse number 12 of Galatians chapter number 6, as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh. They constrain you to be circumcised. He's warning the uncircumcision. He's warning the Gentile believers that there are some out there that desire to make a fair show of your flesh. The, the self-righteous legalists. And they, and they say, they want to make a fair show in your flesh and they constrain you to be circumcised only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh. He says they don't even keep the law but they want you to try to keep the law so that way they can glory in your flesh. Why is that misery loves company? <laughs> and if, hey, there's some people over there that are operating under grace, that doesn't make me feel very good. I'm over here trying to perform in the flesh. Let's try to get them on our side. But a, a, por so a portion of this crowd is the self-righteous. But another portion of this crowd that Paul's going to deal with in Romans chapter 2, you have the self-righteous, yes, but you also have the religious person. You have the, um, the, the religious crowd, the Jews, the circumcision. The circumcision has now been brought low because they've been cut off. As you recall, right? Look over at Romans chapter number 11. Romans chapter 11. So if we, again, if we just talk about this on a very high level, you have the Jews, and the Jews have the covenant of circumcision. And what must a Jew do in order to be saved? A Jew has to circumcise and keep the law in order to be saved. Is it the law that saves the Jew? No. But the faith of the Jew responds to God who says, keep my covenant of circumcision, circumcise your male child on the eighth day or else you'll be cut off, keep my law. Now, Paul comes along and he says, we're no longer under grace, I'm, we're no longer under law, we're under grace because Israel has been cut off. Romans chapter number 11. <clears throat> Romans 11 verse number 20. Romans eleven twenty. 20. Well, uh, um, we're breaking into the context here because we don't have enough time to go through all of Romans 11, but verse 20 says, well, because of unbelief, they were broken off. Who was in unbelief? Israel. Israel. Peter came on, the, on Pentecost in the early part of Acts. You know, they had one year extension period of time in order to believe that Christ was their Messiah. Peter preaches. There were some that were saved. But by and large, Israel was still in unbelief. And, and Paul says, because of unbelief, they were broken off. And thou that standest by faith, who stands by faith? You and I in the body of Christ, in the dispensation of grace, who are saved not by circumcision and keeping the law, but we are saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. 
And you want to know who wants to boast about those works? Is the man that Paul is going to talk about in Romans chapter number 2. Look at verse 25 of Romans 11. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until, until, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Israel's been cut off. Now he's considered everyone in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. So now that Jew who had this privileged position before no longer has the privileged position and is now brought low with the Gentile. And Paul's going to come over there and deal with that self-righteous Jew and say, you think that you're better than them? What? You think that by judging them because they're over there, those uncircumcision, that they're wicked? Paul says, you're wicked in your heart. You're not, you may not be wicked on the outside, but you're just as guilty as them. You condemn yourself when you judge, Paul says. You see, look, the, point, the whole point that I'm trying to make here, just in case that wasn't very clear, is that Paul has to bring everyone to the point where they know they need the gospel. And it's very easy to say, take someone who is broken and who is in the gutter of sin and they're a pig in slop and it's very easy to come along and say, you're a pig in slop, you need the righteousness of Christ. And they could realize that. You know who it's harder to get someone to realize they need the righteousness of Christ? Someone who thinks that they already have self-righteousness. And so Paul is going to have to bring these guys low cut them off at their knees so that way they know that they don't have an excuse and that they too need the righteousness of the gospel of Christ just like those fornicators and murderers and malicious people that he was talking about in chapter number one. So Israel no longer has that privileged position. Now go back to Romans chapter number two Romans chapter 2, so you understand that Israel no longer has a privileged position in the dispensation of grace, even though they had held their privileged position. When they did, they didn't honor God. Look down at verse number 23 of chapter number 2, and Paul says, Thou that makest thy boast of the law. So who is Paul talking about in chapter number 2? He's talking about that Jew, right? You who would boast in the law through breaking the law, Dishonorest thou God? Ha. You're going to boast in the law and then you turn around and break the law. And you're going to sit there and boast in that? Don't you think you're dishonoring God? Now what is that self-righteous Jew going to think? Boy, I really hate that Paul guy. He really, he really digs it in there. <laughs> but he's trying to get that self-righteous Jew to think, hey, look, you're going to boast in the law, but you're breaking that law. You may try to keep it on the outside, but you're not keeping it on the inside. And while Romans chapter number one dealt with the uncircumcision, the people who walked in their own ignorance, chapter two deals with Israel. The first 16 verses of Romans chapter number two, he doesn't name who it is. But in verse number 17, he says, Behold, thou art called a Jew. A Jew. Now, when Paul's writing this, you understand that the that you know he's not building upon Peter's foundation, but he goes out and now he has an all-man ministry, right? Both Jew and Gentile. Uh, he's not going into ki the kingdom program. He's not preaching to Peter's converts to people in the kingdom program. He's talking over to Rome, and when he starts preaching a gospel about the righteousness of Christ and the righteousness that's revealed in the gospel, and you've got a mixed audience over in Rome of some Jews who are at the synagogue and some Gentiles that are out in the street, what's the Jews' response going to be to Paul saying that the gospel of Christ reveals the righteousness of God? That Jew's going to say, I've got the righteousness of God in my law. I keep it day and night. Paul's going to have to point out, no, 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 no. I think you fail to understand, grasshopper. <laughs> okay. 
Israel had a problem with thinking that they were better than the heathen world. Paul's going to have to point this out. You know, it's a good trait of a wise man. Turn over to Matthew chapter number 25. Matthew 25. It's a good trait of a wise man, not so much pointing out the error in what is obviously wrong, such as, you know, politicians, pornographers, etc. You know, it's really easy, right, for people who know the difference between right and wrong to get up here and shoot fish in a barrel. But it's, uh, or by the way, the obvious wicked people who are mentioned in Romans chapter 1, that's really easy, right? Really easy to point out how wicked those very obvious things are. But a wise man is able to discern the error in that which is close to being true. That which is close to being good. You understand that's where wisdom really comes into play. The, the world has passed off a false gospel. The world has passed off a false Christ. And people have bit it hook, line, and sinker because they have no wisdom to see the sleight of hand and the subtle change that people have made. They dress religion up with the trappings of Christianity, with the trappings of Christ, and the, they say these words, and at the heart, they don't even have the same gospel. But a wise man is able to discern that error in those things that are close to true, close to good, but are not so. The Lord Jesus Christ was wise. And notice what he says to those men who are just like the men in Romans chapter number 2. He says in Matthew chapter 23 and verse number 25, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, Cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. What I'm trying to tell you is that Romans chapter number 2 is dealing with the exact same issue here. When he says that they're hypocrites, why are they hypocrites? They say one thing and they do another. For you make clean the outside of the cup. They polish things on the outside of themselves to make it show as in, I'm really good. Look at how great I am. But within, it's unclean. So he calls them whited sepulchers. Why does he call them that? Because they painted it white, right? They make it look all nice and clean on the outside. But what does a sepulcher hold? Dead bodies. Except for the sepulcher of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That doesn't hold dead bodies. That just is a, is a waiting room. <clears throat> Painted out on the outside, looks so nice, looks all white, inside full of dead man's bones. The issue there is that you have hypocrites who someone who was walking by on the outward would look at those Pharisees and say, look at how godly they are. Look at how righteous they are. But on the inside, they're just a bunch of hypocrites. They sin just like everyone else. You know? We have some peculiar people in our grace churches. Why is that? Because we don't teach that you've got to perform in the flesh. We don't have a bunch of people trying to put on a good outer shell for show. We don't have a bunch of people putting on a whited sepulcher. I know you probably wish that I would put some paint on this sepulcher of mine, but, but we're not out there trying to perform. We're not out there trying to make ourselves look good. You know, we all realize that we're all, we all deal with these things together. We're not interested in 
being hypocritical judges of putting other people down just to prop ourselves up. And so Christ points this out in Matthew, and this is the issue that Paul is dealing with in Romans chapter number 2. So that purpose, again, of Romans chapter 1, verse 18, through Romans chapter 3, verse 20, is about the issue of righteousness, where it is found, and why we need it. You know those Pharisees needed righteousness just as much as we did before we trusted the gospel? They seemed righteous on the outside, but they weren't. And so Paul gives the gospel in chapter number 1, And he says, hey everyone, the righteousness of God is available and this is where it can be found. But what if you think that you don't need that righteousness? If in your mind you think, I don't need that, then what? At this church, we've been trying to give away some pens for about three years now. (laughs) I don't know, two years. We bought a big box of pens and we've been trying to give them away. We still have them. The ink is probably going to run dry before we you know, are able to give them all away. We're trying to... What, what's that, Carol? <laughs> well, I, we put them back there in that tray. I'll, <laughs> next week, if I remember, I'll bring them up here. We'll, I'll force you all to take 50. Um, but the point is, why can't we give them those pens away? They're just not valuable to people, you know? People don't really have a need to write as much anymore. They got their computers, they're texting on their phones. I mean, what do I need a pen for? Does this thing work on my phone? Can I write, you know, no, no, well, I don't need the pen anymore. Or it's so valueless because they can find writing utensils whenever they need one, right? So they don't, oh, a pen for free? Yes, thank you. There's just no value there because they don't see the value in it. So too, the self-righteous person looks at the gospel of Christ and says, there's no value there. I don't need his righteousness. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good. The same two premises are true with people and their attitude towards the gospel. They think either A, you know, the same premises like with the pen. Either A, I don't need it. You know, I've got my own righteousness. I don't need Christ. Or B, I can go find that righteousness in another place. I don't like this whole righteousness of Christ. You mean I'm, I have to be, a, you know, I'm accountable to a God who, you know, uh, what? Well, I can go over here and this church teaches me that I can be righteous if I keep these sacraments. If I do these things in my flesh. And then I can have my own righteousness. And it's not, it's not filthy rags. It's not me getting someone else's else's righteousness. (coughs) It's me having my own righteousness. So these self-righteous persons say, I'm good. I don't need it. The religious person says, I don't need it. I can get my righteousness over here. You know. If you don't think that you're guilty, the gospel is meaningless. This is what Paul is trying to accomplish. It's designed to humble men to their knees where they see their guilt before the righteous king and the righteous standard of God, so that when they see their guilt before God, they will need the solution to their guilt, which is the gospel. This section of Romans tells both the Gentile, Romans chapter number 1, and the Jew, Romans chapter number 2, that you're both in need of the gospel. The Jew, you're no, you're no longer good out there. You can't perform circumcision and law keeping. God's doing something different today. You need to trust his son. That's where his righteousness is revealed. There is a righteousness which is of the law, but there is a righteousness which is of faith. And Paul says, you need the righteousness which is of faith. <coughs> I want you to look at the conclusion of this section. If you come over to Romans chapter number 3. I'm telling you that it goes from Romans 1 over to Romans chapter 3 and verse number 20. And I I just want to show you how Paul concludes after he goes through this whole section. And he says in Romans chapter 3 and verse number 9. What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. Paul has proven that they're both under sin. 
He says, what, are we better than they? Are, are, you know, Paul was a Jew, right? Saul of Tarsus, Saul, he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. And he says, what, are we better than they, those uncircumcised dogs? No, no, in no wise, in no wise, for we have proved both before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, only the Jews. There is none righteous, only the Jews who keep the law face faithfully. There is none righteousness, none righteous, no, not one. That's what Paul says. No exception. If there's none righteous, none, zip, zero, zilch, nada, and the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness, and you don't have any righteousness, what predicament do you find yourself in? You find yourself needing righteousness. You find yourself needing the gospel. <coughs> there is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are all, they are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. You mean there's none that doeth good? Paul says back over in, uh, look back at, just as a little side excursion. Look back to verse number 7 of chapter number 2. He says in verse 6 of chapter 2, He will render to every man according to his deeds. To them who by patient continuance in well-doing. What's another word for well-doing? Doing good, right? <laughs> to them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. What does Paul say in Romans chapter 3 there? There are none that doeth good. Verse number 20. Romans chapter 3 verse 20. Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. <coughs> you have this righteous Jew who comes along Paul says the things that he does in Romans chapter number 1, and where does his mindset go? That righteous Jew says, I'm none of those things. I'm not a fornicator. I'm not a... I'm not a what, well, what did Christ say to them back in, when, in his earthly ministry? He said, have you ever looked upon a woman? Have you ever hated your brother? You see, the real standard of righteousness is much higher than the self-righteous man thinks. Because the self-righteous man wants to make himself the standard. The self-righteous man wants to think that he's good and everything below him is not good enough. <coughs> That's why he says back in verse 1, Therefore thou art an inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, you know, the self-righteous man saying, I'm pretty good, look at those guys over there. Wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doeth the same things. Don't give me the, the bill of goods that you're some self-righteous person. Paul says, I ain't buying it. <laughs> you ain't got it. Christ has it. You need Christ. And so he ends in verse number 20 of Romans 3. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. So guess what? whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, whether you think you're righteous in the flesh or whether you realize you're unrighteous, none of you will justify yourselves. You all need the gospel. All right. Chapter 2, <coughs> verse 1. The condition of the unrighteous in, in chapter number 1 tells us that they have the wrath of God awaiting them and how they got to where they are. They, 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 the unrighteous got to the position they were in because they rejected God. So what is the solution? Stop rejecting Him. Stop running away from Him. 
Be renewed in your minds. Trust the gospel. Let Christ change you. Let the word of God work in you and change your mind to be conformed into the image of his son. And then you won't be like this wickedness that's living in the the darkness of your own mind. (coughs) Now chapter 2, the ones who think that they're not like those sinful heathen, Paul's utterly going to remove their excuse. (laughs) That's why he says in verse number 1, Thou art inexcusable, O man. If you're inexcusable, what does that mean? You've got no excuse. You're not, when you stand before the judge in your righteousness and you're condemned, you're not going to have an excuse. An interesting way to think about it. Chapter number one deals with the issue of human evil. You look at the world today, you see the evil, right? You know the evil. It is wicked. It is perverse. And chapter 2 is going to get into the issue of human good. Human trying to, humans trying to be good based upon their own works. Chapter 1, human evil. Chapter 2, human good. These are the people today that when you ask them, do you know if you're going to heaven? Do you know where you'll spend eternity? And their response is, well, I think I'm a pretty good person. Hey, I got just the book for you to read. It's Romans. I'll even point you to the right chapter. Go to chapter number two. See how things work out for you. No, I'm not suggesting being that mean, but you get the point. This is the mindset of the people who think that they're pretty good. They need the knowledge to understand that, no, no, you're not. You're really not. What we have here, go back to to the issue there of judging someone else. Go back to Genesis chapter number 3. Because what we have here is the issue of a good old case of shifting responsibility, right? Right? What do I mean by that? The self-righteous person says, you know, you're saying that there's a penalty for being unrighteous. Look at those people over there. Look at how wicked they are. You know, I'm pretty good. <laughs> Look how wicked they are. And so the self-righteous are just trying to cover up who they are by condemning someone else. Does that make sense to you? They're trying to cover up who they are. They're trying to cover up their need of a Savior by putting the the, the, by condemning someone else and making them their own selves look good. Genesis chapter number 3. <coughs> Genesis chapter number 3. Look at verse number 11. Here's a good old classic case of shifting responsibility. Genesis 3.11. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Uh, God comes down and he walks in the garden. He told Adam and Eve, Don't eat of the, no- the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They eat of the, the tree of the knowledge, Adam and Eve, they eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and then they, they realize they're naked, so they hid themselves. And God says, where are you, Adam? Adam says, I'm over here hiding because uh, I'm naked. And God says, who told you you were naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, Yes, Lord, I'm sorry. I should not have done it. (coughs) No. He says, the first words out of his mouth is, The woman! (laughs) The woman who thou gavest to be with me. (laughs) Not the woman that I needed. Not the woman that I desired. Not the woman that is good for me to be with. But the woman whom thou gavest to me, you see, God, it's all your fault. She gave me of the tree and I did eat. And you notice, you ever sat down with like your kids and if you've got more than one and you sit down with one of them, you said, all right, what did you do? And the one says, well, Johnny over here did this. And you look at Johnny and you're like, okay, Johnny, what did you do? 
And God says, And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, <coughs> The serpent, <laughs> the first words out of the woman's mouth, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And isn't that human nature in a nutshell? It wasn't me. It wasn't me. It's not my fault. You know, I'm sure George has never dealt with that in the workplace. People, uh, people did something wrong and they're just trying to, you know, shuck responsibility and say, it wasn't me. <laughs> it wasn't my fault. It was that engineer that you hired. It was that architect who drew up the blueprints that had this over here. I'm only doing what you told me to do. That is the truth. <laughs> <laughs> it's always the architect's fault because they're not there on site and so when they go when God goes from the man to the woman and she says the serpent and he gets over when you're on the when you're on the job site right if you blame the architect he's not there to defend himself he's back to some cushy office in front of a desk drawing up plans yes so look Romans chapter number two Turn over to Proverbs 27. Proverbs 27. I hope you understand the premise of what we're getting into in Romans chapter number 2 now, right? I think, I think you understand it. I think that we've covered it. <coughs> you have people who are going to try to deflect that responsibility that they have. And Paul's going to give them the what for. In Proverbs chapter 27 and verse number 19. Proverbs 27, 19. As in water, face answereth to face, so the heart of man to man. What happens when you look in a pool of clear water? What do you see? You see yourself. So too, the heart of man to man. When Paul is going to confront the wicked heart and the self-righteous heart, they're going to come to the point where they're going to have to see themselves for who they really are. And they're going to have to make the decision, and am I going to trust in the gospel of Christ? Am I going to believe the truth and realize that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior? And that Christ has died for my sins and that it's not I, I'm looking at myself in the pool of water, I'm looking at myself in the mirror, and I realize I'm just not that great. I realize that my righteousness is as nothing more than a filthy rag in the sight of God, and that I need His righteousness. I need the gospel of Christ. I need to trust that Christ died for my sins, was buried, and rose again for my justification. And when you do that, you remove yourself out of, position, out of the position of high-mindedness, right? Because when you come to the point in your life when you realize that you need to trust the gospel, you realize there's nothing that you could have ever done to save yourself, that there's nothing that you could have ever done to keep yourself saved, and that you need the righteousness of Christ. You know, that's a humble attitude. That's a humble mindset. That's the exact opposite of what you find in Romans chapter number 2. What you find in Romans chapter number 2 is the high-mindedness of someone who thinks they don't need the gospel. And that's just simply not true. So what about you tonight? What's your heart attitude? Have you trusted the gospel? Do you have a humble heart? Do you realize that you need Christ's righteousness? I hope you do. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We're thankful for your word. We're thankful for the example that we have in it and the instruction that we find in it. We're thankful, Lord, that we understand the issue that, uh, that Paul is dealing with here in the beginning of Romans. We thank you for making it so clear in your word, Lord, that we ought not to be those, uh, those in, in those wicked positions that Romans chapter number one talks about with the issues of human evil, and we see that in our, our world. and that we ought to be uh, changed uh, by you and the working of your word through us, Lord, that we ought to, to, to um, approach our lives with a, a sense that of, 
of, of, of, of the holiness that you've called us unto, that we would present our bodies a living sacrifice, Lord, that we wouldn't be um, uh, dirty sepulchers and we wouldn't be whited sepulchers, but we would be bodies that are full of life, the life that you've given to us that's just living for you. And not only that, Lord, but not uh, in our mind, not thinking more highly of ourselves than we ought, understanding that it's not us, that, that it, it's, it's all of you. And to have that humble mindset of, of, of realizing where our righteousness comes from. And to just serve our life, live our life, and serve you in the wonderful truth of realizing how complete you've made us in your Son. That all of that has been fulfilled, and that we have uh, peace and joy with you, that we have access to you. The wonderful position that we have in, why would anyone want to be in the positions that we find those people in Romans 1 and Romans 2. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.